My name is Hillary Johnson. I married a doctor and struggled to have children. But in the 12th year of our marriage, I got pregnant at 40. Excitedly, I told my husband, I'd rather have a smart kid with your young and beautiful sister than an ugly kid with you at an advanced maternal age. He said, handing me divorce papers. At that time, my sister Melissa was 35. She was unbelievably beautiful. Melissa's dream was to marry a high-earning professional, like a doctor or lawyer. And the one who got her pregnant was my ex-husband, Kevin. When I first got married, Melissa envied me for marrying a high earner like Kevin. Her feelings were a parade of envy, jealousy, and spite, always questioning why someone as plain as me could marry such a successful man when she couldn't. But I'm not that plain. I consider myself average, just inferior to my sister. But Kevin decided to marry me and then fell in love with Melissa when he met her at our wedding reception. Why didn't you introduce me to your sister before deciding to marry me? When Kevin came to my house to propose, Melissa was out on a date. She didn't show up at the family meeting either because she was at a mixer. So why would I go out of my way to introduce him to my sister? Even so, She's your only sister, so isn't it sensible to meet before getting married? What kind of rule is that? Meeting the parents is essential, but meeting the sister isn't. But since Kevin didn't push it further, I thought he was joking and laughed it off. Kevin worked at a medical center and was a dedicated doctor. If there was an emergency, he prioritized his patients over any plans we had. I respected him for that. But after we got married, it only intensified. He would rush to the hospital, even when he was home, if a patient's condition changed, sometimes not returning at all. It's great that you're so dedicated to your work, but I'm worried you'll ruin your health. Even though I admired him as a doctor, wasn't this too much? How was he as a husband? I had my doubts, but I chose him, thinking he might change once we had children. I kept telling myself that. However, after 10 years of marriage, I started questioning Kevin's behavior. Sure, he was dedicated, but he began staying away from home too often. Worried about his health, I made him a lunch and brought some clothes to the hospital. But I was told Kevin had already gone home. The nurse who informed me looked at me with pity, as if she knew something. After that, I started to suspect something was wrong and once went to the hospital when Kevin's shift ended. I saw him meeting a woman outside the hospital. From the back, she looked familiar but I couldn't be sure. More than that, if what I suspected was true, I was too scared to confront him. If it was just an affair, it would end eventually. I thought ignoring it might help maintain our marriage rather than causing trouble and making it serious. Maybe that's how I felt, but I was wrong. One day, I asked Kevin, what do you think of women like my sister? Melissa? Yes, Melissa. She's beautiful, isn't she? Is she your type, Kevin? Well, compared to you, she's definitely prettier. If I had to marry, I'd prefer a beautiful woman. What would you do if Melissa said she wanted to date you? Kevin stared at me. He might have been wondering whether to tell the truth or brush it off. Of course, I wanted him to say he'd choose me. I wanted him to say Melissa was just my sister. 
But Kevin said nothing. After that, he came home even less. I shouldn't have asked such a thing. Maybe he thought it was silly. Maybe he found it bothersome. If I hadn't said anything, maybe we could have stayed as a couple. These thoughts filled me with regret. In the midst of this regret, I received the news that I was pregnant. Honey, I'm pregnant. We finally have a baby. We had wanted a child for so long, but couldn't have one. Every time I saw parents with their children, I was so envious. Finally, we can be parents. I was so happy, I called my husband at work. But Kevin's response was cold. You know I'm at work. Don't call me for something like this. I'm busy. I'm sorry. Hey, can you come home early today? I'll cook something delicious. Let's celebrate. How should I know if I can come home early? I'm a doctor. I never know when an emergency will come up. He said this and didn't come home. I thought he'd be kinder once he knew I was pregnant. I thought he'd be happy with me, but he wasn't. Where has his heart gone? I cried, feeling miserable. I spent a sleepless night. A week later, when Kevin finally came home, he told me he'd rather have a smart kid with my young and beautiful sister than an ugly kid with me. A kid? Yeah, Melissa's pregnant too, so our relationship is over. He laughed and placed the divorce papers on the table, urging me to sign them quickly. So it was Melissa after all. There was no mistake. Fifteen years have passed since then. I've raised them well, haven't I? And triplets, no less. Remembering that day still makes me bitter and sad. But from that day on, I began looking forward to the birth of my daughters. Thanks to my daughters, I was able to overcome Kevin's betrayal. Now they are in middle school. A lot has happened, huh? When one of them suddenly gets a fever, all three get sick together, and I've taken them to the hospital alone. They always wear the same clothes, and if I dress them differently, they complain. Life was tough, and I made three identical outfits by hand, finding solace in my children's smiles. Now, my daughters have grown into undeniably beautiful young women. Who do they take after? It's amazing how they turned out so beautiful. It's almost unbelievable that I could give birth to such stunning kids. My mother, who often helped take care of them, used to say that they inherited the best traits from both Kevin and me. If that's true, then my daughters are lucky. Once, Kevin called me ugly, and it hurt deeply back then. But now, when I look at my children, I wonder what he'd think if he saw them. It amuses me. I never thought I'd see Kevin again, or that he'd meet our children. But one day, my mother, who adored my kids, had to be hospitalized. When I went to visit, I found out it was the hospital where Kevin worked. It's a big hospital. So I didn't think we'd run into each other. But as fate would have it, you always meet the people you least want to see. Hey, Hillary, is that you? I turned around and saw him in a white coat. Fifteen years had passed, and his hair was now noticeably gray. The salt and pepper hair had taken away his once handsome appearance. What's up? You here for the geriatric department? The geriatric department deals with mental and physical health issues in the elderly, like memory loss, declining comprehension, and mood swings. So he was implying that I was old, 
even though he was older than me. But those words didn't hurt me anymore. Thanks to him, I had developed a strong spirit. I laughed off Kevin's words and tried to walk away. Hey, I went out of my way to talk to you. Don't ignore me. He followed me. Why? Are you so free now that you're 60? Well, I'm not as busy as I used to be. I have subordinates now. Good for you, but I'm busy. Come on, it's been 15 years. Let's talk for a bit. I don't want to talk to you. I get it. You had a hard time after I left you, right? Life must have been tough. But who could blame me? Who'd want to spend their life with an ugly woman like you? Thanks for that. And look at you now, you've aged even more. You were ugly before, but now it's even worse. And you've changed too. You're 60 now, right? Your hair's all gray. Where did the man I used to know go with the salt and pepper hair? Well, it'd be weird if I stayed the same forever, wouldn't it? He never changes, does he? True, but with that salt and pepper hair, won't your beloved wife dislike you? Don't worry, that's not a problem. Oh, really? But you can't beat age, can you? You're close to retirement, aren't you? I'm still going strong. You're already 55, right? You should start preparing for retirement. Your kids are only 15, so you've got seven more years to work hard. True. I don't need the geriatric department just yet. Can you afford to send your kids to college? You don't have any skills, so I bet you only work as a cashier at a grocery store. Don't you dare mock grocery store cashiers. My kids are definitely going to college and will become doctors. Good for you. Your kids must be ugly and dumb, so college is pointless for them. Maybe, maybe not. By the way, did you have a boy? A dumb boy is the worst. I have daughters. Well, at least that's good. Even dumb girls can make money. Maybe you should get them into some service job after high school. Even though we're divorced, how can you say such things about your own children? The only kids I have are the ones with Melissa. Speaking of Melissa, I haven't seen her in 15 years. How's she doing? Oh, she's supposed to come to the hospital today. Is she still as beautiful as ever? Of course she is. What are you talking about? Kevin sounded uncertain, as if he wasn't entirely sure. My instincts told me something was up. Your kids must be really smart, right? After all, you chose to have smart kids over ugly ones when we divorced. Of course, they're my kids. I'd love to see Melissa and the kids. They're my nephews, after all. You don't need to see them. There's no need. But we're family. It's natural to want to see my relatives. I said there's no need to see them. Why not? I don't mind letting you see my kids. Isn't it strange how you're so against it? She's my sister, you know. It's only natural for me to want to see her. Melissa doesn't want to see you. Really? We're only two sisters. I don't want our lives to end without seeing each other again. It's better to stay apart. The difference in living standards would just cause problems. That's not true. She's my sister, and I'd be happy to see her living well. You'd be jealous if you're poor and she's rich. No, I wouldn't. Envying others is pointless.
You worry too much. People aren't that pure. If Melissa is living well, you'd be envious and might even ask for money. That's ridiculous. At this age, I'd never do that. Besides, what Melissa does with her life doesn't affect me. I don't envy her at all. Still, it's better if you don't meet. Why are you so stubborn? Is there something you're hiding? There's nothing to hide. Then there's no problem with us meeting. I really want to see my sister. As we were talking, my sister actually appeared. It seems the old saying, speak of the devil, came true. But she was unimaginably overweight. Her face was completely different from 15 years ago, now ugly and distorted. Hillary. Huh. Who are you? Come on, did you forget your own sister? What? How? My surprise was natural. Melissa, who was once model thin and a beauty icon during the divorce drama, had now become exactly what Kevin hated, fat and unattractive. How did you end up like this? She's practically a lump of meat. Kevin is a doctor. Shouldn't he be able to help you maintain your looks? Well, I thought doctors made tons of money. I figured plastic surgery costs would be nothing. But Kevin's income turned out to be less than I expected. And with the kids, there was no money left for beauty treatments. Melissa laughed, her large body shaking, seemingly indifferent about her looks. She used to undergo repeated cosmetic surgeries, altering her eyes, nose, and even getting liposuction. Full body hair removal was a given, always keeping her skin smooth, maintaining all that required money. And that money was supposed to come from her husband, a doctor or lawyer. I thought you'd keep up the surgeries even after getting married. I wanted to, but with five kids, there's no money left for myself. Surrounding Melissa were boys with similar impressive physiques, holding snacks in their hands. They look just like you, Melissa. Yes, they do. And boys eat a lot. Yes, they sure do. Just like you did as a kid. They all really did resemble Melissa. It's not just about eating a lot or being boys. None of them resemble Kevin much, though. Just a bit here and there. Oh, it's good that they look like my husband. No one ever said they looked like you. Melissa laughed heartily, but Kevin just gave a wry smile. These days, plastic surgery is advanced, especially in places like Korea. It's good to be born in modern times. Absolutely. If I had the money, I'd get surgery again. But first, I want my kids to have it. Then they'll all be handsome and can marry rich women. Yeah, but even with kids, it's strange that Kevin's income isn't enough to cover things. Oh, he has debts. That's why I don't have money. Debts? Did he have debts when he was married to you? Yes, around $30,000 when you stole him. $30,000? That's nothing. Now it's $180,000. How did it grow so much? He's always buying cars. We don't even have enough parking space, and he only has one body. It's pointless, but he insists on buying more. I think it's amazing you can laugh about it, Melissa. Really? So, it's mutual then. What do you mean? He didn't know you had plastic surgery, did he? Yet he fell head over heels for your beauty. You thought he was a money tree, 
but he spent it all, which was unexpected, right? Yeah, I never thought he'd be such a big spender. I feel the same. I had no idea that face was made with plastic surgery. You look so beautiful without makeup. I thought you were naturally gorgeous, Melissa. I was completely fooled. And now your face is falling apart. If that's how you feel, then instead of buying cars, you should have spent that money on me. I'd still be beautiful now. That's true. Melissa always said she'd become beautiful and saved up money for it. Exactly. But marrying someone like Kevin, who can't support that, made everything revert. To maintain beauty, you need a rich husband, right? Oh well, it's too late now. No one to impress anymore. I see. Hillary, have you had any plastic surgery? What? I mean, since Melissa had surgery, it's not surprising if her sister did too. Melissa lacked confidence and turned to surgery. But I'm confident in myself, so I didn't need it. Really? So, you look like this naturally, while Melissa needed surgery and is now falling apart. Don't talk like that about the person you chose. She's still my sister. Yeah, but you're from the same parents. So, our kids must look similar. They must be ugly. Oh, you hope they're ugly because losing would be frustrating, right? But I'm the winner here. No way. Mom. I turned to the voice calling me and saw my three daughters. They were stunningly beautiful. Who are they? My kids. No way. And three of them. Yes, they were triplets. Are they really your kids? Yes, they are. I can't believe it. Why are they so different? They have the same roots. The same roots? Yeah. Same grandparents. I'm their dad. So why are they so different? Well, what can I say? They're not really your kids, are they? Excuse me? Don't be rude. These girls are my biological children. If they're your kids, why are they so beautiful? Maybe because they have the best traits from both of us. If you keep saying stupid things, I'll sue you for defamation. But they're so beautiful. They don't need any surgery. Surely they haven't had surgery already? Of course not. How dare you be so insulting? Yeah, I guess so. What are you mumbling about? I admit they look good, but that doesn't mean they're smart. They must have gotten their bad brains from you, right? Oh, stop it. You're the worst. But your pride might take a hit, because these kids are actually super smart. No way. They're your kids. They're yours, too. Oh. All three have an IQ of 130 and are aiming for med school. Med school? That's amazing. Just like their mom. What do you mean? Well, Hillary was always top of her class. I was always at the bottom, so I knew I couldn't compete academically. That's why I focused on my looks. Huh? But you told me you were top of your class, too. Did you believe that? I exaggerated to marry you. I thought you'd figure it out. No way. So, these kids. Kevin looked at his kids with disdain. What a jerk. My kids always forget things. When I scold them, they forget something else the next day. I've given up. They're always at the bottom in tests. I wondered who they took after, but it's clearly me. Well, I thought they'd be smart like you, Kevin, 
but I guess they're more like Melissa. But they'll probably grow up to be very kind. Yes, personality is more important than brains. That being said, my sister isn't exactly known for her good personality either. If she had a good personality, she wouldn't have stolen someone's husband. Melissa laughed brightly, while Kevin looked frustrated. Why? Why are our kids dumb and yours are so smart? I can't accept this. Kevin, that's inappropriate in front of the kids. You said Melissa's kids would be smart when we divorced. How could I know she'd be at the bottom of her class? I was deceived. You didn't have the insight to see the truth? I trusted what Melissa said. How pathetic. Well, at least you got to marry a beautiful woman. That should be enough. No matter how upset he is, he can't change reality. But Kevin looked furious, his mouth twisted in frustration. My daughters whispered among themselves. Who is this guy? Are these kids really aiming to become doctors? Yes, it runs in the family. Doctors, huh? Mom, is this guy someone you know? Well, I wouldn't call him a friend. But yes, we know each other. What are you talking about? I'm your father. I made you. My daughter's face is filled with contempt. It's natural, given that I've always told them the truth whenever they asked about their dad. I told them what kind of man their father was, how he didn't care about hurting people. I know you shouldn't teach kids such things. But if Kevin found out about my daughters and showed up, he might use his money to take them away. Kevin would definitely want to claim their beauty and intelligence for himself. That's why I did it. And now, it's all unfolding right before my eyes. But... Oh, you're the guy who abandoned us. One of my daughters said, and another added. A man who can't see past appearances. And another laughed. So that's why you didn't notice the plastic surgery. Finally, they all said in unison, what a pathetic old man. Kevin seemed at a loss for how to respond. Since waiting for Kevin to react was pointless, I turned to see what my daughters were holding. What did you buy? You said you were going to the bookstore, right? Yeah, we thought they'd have what we needed, and they did. They showed me a stack of reference books. Middle school studies are boring now, so we got college-level reference books, a German book, and some medical books. Sharing books has been their habit since they were little. And now, with similar goals, they still do. If you want to be a doctor, mastering German is important. Right, mister? Are they really this smart? They're still in middle school. I told you, they have an IQ of 130. Mom, we need to go see Grandma. She's waiting. Yes, let's go. As we left, Melissa waved and said, See you later while Kevin, looking defeated, said nothing. A month later, Kevin called. He said something unbelievable. Give me those kids. What? Those kids? Yes, the three daughters you raised. Why? You have your own children. They're hopeless idiots. I don't want them. The daughters you raised have my genes. They're definitely mine, so give them to me. What? You think I'd give my precious daughters to someone who says he doesn't want his own kids? Think before you speak. I'm about to retire, but I'll be working as a consulting doctor afterward. I'll make sure they become doctors. 
but you can do that, can you? Why not? Becoming a doctor requires money. How can a single woman afford tuition? It would be a waste if these three brilliant kids couldn't become doctors because of a lack of money. You don't need to worry about that. How can you say that? Do you even know how much it costs to become a doctor? I'm remarried. Remarried? To who? The director of the hospital where you work. What? You're the director's wife? Yes. So, when they become doctors, they'll work at that hospital and eventually take over. A gold mine. That's not the point. Becoming a doctor is their dream, their goal. It's not about money. But it's a fact. It is a gold mine. That's why they'll never respect you, Dr. Johnson. Come on, there are three of them. Can I have just one? Just one would be enough to ensure my old age is secure. My own kids are useless. Kids aren't money trees. That's an idealistic view. I'm in real trouble here. I can't believe someone like you is a doctor. You better watch out. I don't care if you don't remarry me. Just give me the kids. Kevin kept shouting desperately, but I hung up without hesitation. Angry. I consulted my husband. He immediately had Kevin transferred. His new position was at a small clinic in a remote mountain village, serving mainly elderly patients. Instead of working diligently, Kevin developed a terrible reputation. He would treat beautiful women politely, but was rude and dismissive to everyone else. At the medical center, patients and nurses celebrated his departure. He was shocked to realize how much he was disliked. He never thought that people perceived him in such a negative way. He would often say, There's no way I'm staying in this backwater clinic forever. I'm not the kind of man who will get buried in a place like this, or whatever. Of course, what he was really complaining about wasn't his position or sense of purpose, but the significant pay cut he suffered by being sent to such a remote location. His main argument was that he couldn't support his five children on such a reduced salary. However, it seems the children are thriving, enjoying the abundant nature and playing happily every day. Melissa occasionally contacted me, expressing her relief and happiness with their new life. While Melissa and the kids adapted well, Kevin struggled. He took a part-time job at a distant hospital to make ends meet. However, despite working part-time, their difficult financial situation hasn't changed. He managed to get by while paying off debts, but unlike his family, who were gaining weight from a healthy lifestyle, it seemed he is losing weight drastically, possibly due to illness. Melissa informed me recently that Kevin had become weak and lost his once high spirits. His pride was always high, but mentally he was fragile. Seeing him suffer was satisfying. As for me, my children continue to grow beautifully and we live a happy life together. Although I married John, I've had a difficult relationship with his mother, Mary, and his son from his previous marriage, Brian. One day, through Brian, Mary invited me on a trip to Spain. Holding a faint hope that the trip might improve our relationship, I arrived on the day with some anticipation. Before boarding, after I had entrusted my wallet to Mary, she handed me a divorce form already filled out by John. A divorce paper? Why? It's because you can't get along with Brian and me. 
John always complained about you. He's sick of it. Mary mocked my stunned expression and walked to the boarding gate with my wallet in hand. In disbelief, I stared at the divorce papers and my eyes widened. This handwriting is Brian's. A fierce anger welled up inside me. I'll have fun with the real family. The fake mom can sleep outside. To Brian's mocking, I responded with a forced smile. Sure. I've been holding back and enduring it because they are John's family, but no more. I'll make them regret trampling over my feelings. My name is Victoria, and I'm a 50-year-old housewife. While working as a florist, I used my flower coordination certification to take on decorating event venues and wedding reception halls. I divorced 10 years ago due to my husband's infidelity and thought I was done with marriage, but I met John, who runs an event company, three years ago and remarried after a year of dating. Unlike my former husband, John isn't great at small talk and struggles with social smiles, but he is sincere and serious. For me, who lost both my parents, he is a reassuring and important presence. I cherish these happy days, but there's one thing that bothers me. My stepson, Brian, still hasn't opened up to me. Of course, I've tried in my own way. As the person in charge of cooking, I was quick to learn about his food preferences, and I bought CDs of his favorite band to create common ground, even getting to know their songs well enough to sing them at karaoke. If a drama came up in conversation, I watched it too, and when I heard about an event with his favorite actor, I gifted him tickets. But it seems all my efforts have missed the mark. Don't try to suck up to me too. When I was told this, I was truly shocked. Suck up? I just want to get along. Then, Brian grimaced deeply. I don't plan on becoming family with you. Just leave me alone. His dismissive tone pierced my heart like a knife. The tricky part is, Brian acts all nice to me when John is around. Thinking back to before we were married, when we went out together a few times, Brian would give me a friendly smile and chat. That's why I believed we could get along well after getting married. I was prepared that it would be difficult for Brian, who is already an adult, to call me mom, but he called me worse things when John wasn't around. Hey old lady, restock the drinks in the fridge. And hey, where are my socks? It seems he switches up the names depending on his mood. When are you going to get the hang of our family's tastes? My late mom was a much better cook. Pretending to be a mom when you can't even cook properly is just annoying. After being nagged so persistently, I couldn't take it anymore and asked him, Brian, if there are things I'm lacking, can you tell me? I'll try to improve. Then, Brian twisted his lips into a sneer. Figure it out yourself. You have a brain, don't you? It's because you're so stupid that you got cheated on. And then, Brian continued to taunt me as I remained silent. You're just after dad's money, aren't you? Dad should have chosen someone younger and prettier. I don't see what he sees in you. Being criticized for my looks, I couldn't argue back. Though John was just an acquaintance from work and as charming as an actor, why he asked me out is still a mystery to me. Once, I overheard a conversation between Brian and his friend and found out that Brian had dropped out of college and was aimlessly drifting. Brian, I lent you $5,000 because you said it was for your training. What? Did I say that? You haven't told your dad that you dropped out of college, have you? You better tell him. Then, Brian glared at me with disdain. Shut up. A high school grad should just keep quiet. Listen, if you spill the beans to dad, remember what will happen. I wonder if Brian wants to discuss it himself. It's obvious that it would be better if Brian talks about it directly rather than me revealing it. 
After some deliberation, I decided not to tell John about Brian dropping out of college. I really wanted to discuss Brian's cold behavior towards me, but considering John works late every night, I didn't want to burden him with unnecessary worries, so I kept it to myself. After getting married, Brian teamed up with John's mother, Mary, who dislikes me. Mary, who lives just a 30-minute drive away, would drop by unexpectedly and criticize everything, saying the house wasn't clean enough or the meals were meager. One day, I came home from work and was surprised to find Mary cooking dinner in the kitchen. Glancing at the trash can, I saw the ingredients I had prepared that morning ruthlessly discarded. Mary brought the mac and cheese and soup to the table and began eating dinner facing Brian. Brian savored it with a delighted expression. Grandma's mac and cheese really is the best. Right. Mary smiled broadly. Victoria, why don't you learn to cook from Grandma? Then maybe you could make a decent meal. Brian and John, poor things, having to eat lousy food every day. But leaving the care of John and Brian to just work, you really fail as a wife. John is too kind, letting you get away with it. Oh my God, if Grandma's house were closer, I'd go there for dinner every night. I can't understand the nerve of someone who throws away someone else's food ingredients and cheerfully badmouths others while eating dinner. Additionally, my job is part-time, not full-time, so I'm home by the evening. I handle the weekday household chores alone to support John, who is always busy. I really don't understand why Mary complains about me. Essentially, she probably doesn't like that I'm working. I can't understand, why did John remarry someone like her? Was he deceived? He hasn't realized she's after his wealth. Do you think so too? John is kind and stubborn. I suggested he marry a lady from a family suitable for a CEO, but he chose his partner himself and wouldn't listen. After complaining about me to Brian for over two hours, Mary left only leaving John's portion of the dinner. Reluctantly, I was eating some ready-made dishes when Brian looked down at me with pity and smirked. Grandma really hates you as usual. It seems so. Why don't you stop trying to charm Dad and make an effort to be liked by Mary? How dare you say that after stirring things up yourself? I was astonished. But well, it's okay since Mary lives separately. The problem is Brian. Being confronted with such blatant hostility makes me feel we might never get along, which is depressing. That evening, since John was working overtime, Brian and I quietly had dinner together. After dinner, while I was cleaning up, Brian unusually started a conversation. Hey. What? Grandma invited me to go on a trip to Spain. So, let's all go. I was taken aback. Are you talking to me? It's okay for me to come along? Yeah. Grandma said that maybe if we go on a trip, we could see different sides of each other and possibly get along better. Brian continued, somewhat embarrassed. Mary is still actively working as the CEO of a family-owned group of companies. She is not living on a pension, but is still actively working, which probably explains why she has financial comfort. More than the invitation itself, I was pleased that Mary and Brian were showing a willingness to bridge the gap with me. So, keep the third week of next month free. Got it. I'll take some time off. That night, when John came home from work, he sounded disappointed as he spoke. I've got a business trip to France that week. Then maybe I should decline. You should go ahead. I might be able to stop by Spain on my way back and at least have a meal together. That's nice, but you've been quite busy. Are you getting enough rest? Expressing my concern, John smiled kindly. I'm fine, thanks. John knows that Mary dislikes me. 
I'm surprised that mom invited you on the trip. She's stubborn and can be harsh, but maybe she really wants to get along with you, Victoria. Normally, she wouldn't want to travel with someone she dislikes. With that line, I made up my mind. Let's get along with Mary and Brian in Spain. Hopefully, our past tensions will turn into laughable stories as we close the distance between us. On the day of our trip to Spain, Brian and I went to the airport with John. After seeing John off on his direct flight to Charles de Gaulle Airport, we waited in the lobby for a while until Mary appeared, pulling her suitcase. When I thanked her for inviting us on the trip, Mary smiled brightly. Victoria, why don't you give me your wallet to keep it safe? You might lose it. What? You won't need it. I'll handle all the shopping in Spain. Look, Brian too. Okay. Brian handed his wallet to Mary, so I reluctantly took out my long wallet and entrusted it to her. Mary opened my wallet and nodded with satisfaction. As expected, you brought credit cards and cash. Tourists are easy targets for pickpockets. It seems so. Thank you. After putting my wallet in her bag, Mary exchanged a sly look with Brian. I felt a sense of a niece seeing their expressions. Also, this. John asked me to give this to you. Can you open it here? As I opened the envelope Mary handed to me, I felt bewildered. The moment I took out the contents, I felt like my breath stopped. A divorce paper? Why? Mary's face lit up with a triumphant smile. It's because you can get along with Brian and me. John always complained about you. I heard it too. He's sick of being around you. I felt like collapsing to my knees. So, you're no longer needed. Goodbye. Wait, my wallet. Ignoring my plea as if she couldn't hear me, Mary quickly walked away, pulling her suitcase. I can't believe it. The kind and sincere John was talking behind my back with Mary and Brian. As I stared at the filled out divorce form, my eyes suddenly widened. This handwriting is Brian's. It resembles John's, but has its unique quirks. My feeling of devastation suddenly turned into fierce anger. I was a fool to trust these two. I was so eager to get along through this trip. Too bad, you poor thing. This might be your last chance ever for an international trip. With a snide smile, Brian blurted out. I'll have fun with the real family. The fake mom can sleep outside. To Brian's mocking, I responded with a forced smile. Sure. I glared at Brian's back until he disappeared into the crowd. I've been holding back and enduring it because they are John's family, but no more. I'll make them regret trampling over my feelings. Although left penniless at the airport, I had no intention of succumbing to Mary and Brian's harassment. I used the transit app on my cell phone to catch a train and calmly made my way home. Brian used to bike to college, and Mary only uses her phone for messages and calls, so they must have forgotten about this. Once home and my anger slightly subdued, I made a call to someone. Afterward, I sat blankly on the sofa for a while. It's unfortunate I couldn't go on the trip to Spain, but if I really want to, I can go anytime. Besides, it wouldn't have been fun with such spiteful people anyway. I comforted myself and spent the day relaxing, reading books, and watching dramas online. Thinking about it, this was the first time since getting married that I've been alone. Usually, even if John is away on business, Brian is around, and Mary makes unexpected visits, so someone is always at home. Though the trip fell through, having a week to myself without having to see Brian or Mary feels like a luxurious vacation in its own right. The next day, after finishing my chores early, I went out to watch a movie and enjoyed some shopping at the mall on my way back.
In the afternoon, while I was drinking coffee and watching TV at home, my phone suddenly rang. I had a feeling it would be soon. Annoyed at picking it up right away, I ignored it for a while, but the message tones kept sounding one after another. Reluctantly answering, I was yelled at by Brian. Old lady. Get to Spain now. What? Don't be ridiculous. Is that the TV? Are you at home? How can you get back if grandma stole your wallet and cards? I have a transit app installed on my phone. It has my credit card too, so honestly, I'm not really struggling. Gosh, whatever. Just get over here. What happened? When I asked, Brian said roughly. I made reservations at a three-star restaurant at the hotel, but they won't let us in. Really? Why is that? I asked him deliberately. That damn owner said, if Victoria isn't accompanying you, we must decline your patronage. So, you missed out on the filet mignon steak? That's too bad. The view from the 36th floor is spectacular, and the meat is tender and delicious. I said to Brian, laughing as he raged on. Brian seemed unable to contain his anger. Even when we tried going to other stores in the hotel, the clerks turned us away at the door. The hotel staff were whispering in Spanish, and it was incredibly uncomfortable. So, we ended up just going to a supermarket outside, and had juice and snacks for dinner. There's a supermarket outside the hotel, right? You know it well. Brian muttered suspiciously, then quickly flared up again. Damn it. Why do I have to eat this kind of food after coming all the way to Spain? Grandma got so angry, her blood pressure soared and she had to lie down. It's all your fault. Sorry about that. It made no sense why it would be my fault, but to avoid further hassle, I apologized. Since it's your fault, you should compensate us for the hotel and meals. It's only fair since you made us feel bad. I laughed in disbelief. Sure. Really? Yes. But only if you return the $5,000 you borrowed from me. Please do that before I file the divorce papers. Oh, looks like even if I add the hotel and meal expenses, there'll be some change left over. Brian suddenly fell silent. No doubt, he intended to default on his debt to me amidst the divorce confusion. Of course, I have no intention of divorcing at all. After a brief silence, Brian spat out with venom. Just give me the $5,000 as a gift. You are so stingy. This is why poor people stay poor. He was ranting as much as he wanted. At this point, I was almost amused beyond being angry. Then, I heard Mary's voice from behind Brian. Brian, are you talking to Victoria? Yes, Grandma. If you have something to say to her, better say it before the divorce. We won't be seeing her much longer. Let me have the phone. Victoria, was your maiden name Smith? Mary asked with a tense voice. Yes, that's right. I had been expecting this question. So, are you perhaps the daughter of the Smith group? Yes, my brother took over, so it's strange to call me the daughter now. There was a shriek from the other end of the line. It seemed like Mary almost fainted, and I could hear Brian panicking. Grandma, what's wrong? If you're feeling ill, you should rest. No. I'm fine. So that's why we got reservations at the popular restaurant so easily. Mary muttered in shock. The Smith Group. That's the chain known for catering to celebrities, right? It's very popular even overseas. After a pause, Brian yelled. What? Victoria is a Smith Group's daughter. Seems so. What? I didn't know that. Were you hiding it? What a nasty character. I responded coolly to Brian's rants. That's strange. 
I mentioned it during the pre-marriage introduction. John definitely knows. Really, did you? I've been so forgetful lately. They probably never paid proper attention to what I said. I added, My father was the president of Smith before he passed away. I inherited his estate, so I have never been in need of money. I didn't marry John for his money. Oh really? Then why do you even work at a flower shop? You could live on John's earnings alone. A wife should quit her jobs and devote herself to her husband and children. That's right. Well, then I'll take the $5,000 after all. I should have asked for more money from someone rich like you. I missed a chance. Despite being shocked to learn about my background, Mary and Brian quickly recovered and reverted to their usual tones, showering me with snide remarks. I will be asking for the money I lent to Brian back. That's a separate matter, right? You haven't filed the divorce papers, have you? Well, not yet. Then, invest $1 million in our company. I was speechless. What? A wife should be able to do that much. It's pocket change for you. I can't do that. Even if I had the money, I wouldn't give it. Mary, whining to get her way, then snapped at me harshly when I firmly refused. What a stingy woman. Don't you want to be useful at all? Poor John. It's sad he married someone like you. Mary began to rant nonsensically. Fine. When John arrives in Spain tonight, I'll fill his ears with all sorts of bad things about you. It would be good for you to be despised and hated by kind John and get a divorce. I'll make up some stories too. If I say you bullied me, Simple Dad will probably believe it. Brian added gleefully to Mary. If you won't give us the money, we don't need a presumptuous wife like you. I'll tell John you wrote the divorce papers yourself. A serious guy like him gets scary when he's mad. I'm looking forward to tonight. No need to wait until tonight. I've been listening right here. John then spoke over the phone, and the two were silenced. What? John? Weren't you supposed to join us after your business trip? Why are you back in the US? You said you were working until yesterday and would arrive in Spain tonight. In response to Mary and Brian's panic, John answered, I was surprised when Victoria sent me the image of the divorce papers, so I called back immediately. I was skeptical after hearing about it, so I hurried to finish my work and flew back to listen to the conversation between Victoria, Mom, and Brian. What? Dad? You're misunderstanding something. Grandma and I were the ones being mistreated by Victoria. John dismissed Brian's calmer tone outright. It's too late for excuses. I've been listening to the conversation on speaker the whole time. Who's really the terrible one here? Gosh, it's Victoria's fault for provoking us. What? We even prepared the divorce papers out of kindness. Wait, by the way, you two are returning tomorrow, right? I've informed the police. Police? Why? We haven't done anything wrong. The divorce paper is Brian. You filled out John's section, right? That's forgery of a sealed private document. You'll be arrested for that. Startled by my statement, the two began accusing each other over the phone. Hey, Grandma. I wouldn't have done it if I knew I'd be arrested. What are you going to do about this? What? I have nothing to do with this. It was Brian who planned and executed this mean trick on Victoria. What? Don't mess with me. Brian yelled at Mary over the phone. The conversation isn't over yet. Mom, Brian quit college on his own and was spending a lot at nightclubs. And you not only turned a blind eye, but also gave him pocket money, right? Yes, that's right. 
What's wrong with giving my dear grandson Brian some money? That's right. That's right. Brian chimed in as Mary brazenly admitted it. John then coldly stated, It's fine to give pocket money, but it's a serious crime if you embezzled funds from the company. What? That's bad. Brian seemed to pale over the phone. Look, I'm just a figurehead president. The salary isn't much. Give me a break. If you do that, I might lose my chance to take over Dad's company, right? Brian lamented, to which John declared, That's off the table. I'm going independent. After a pause, Brian exclaimed, Hey, that's not what we agreed on. You said I'd take over after I graduated. Who was it that dropped out after just one year? Damn it. All right, I'll enroll in another school and really study this time. So keep your promise and let me take over the business. Do you really think I'd entrust my company to someone who spews abuse at Victoria? Looking at John's profile filled with anger, I felt a warmth in my chest. John was the only one on my side. It felt like all the days I endured their verbal abuse were finally being rewarded. I'm going to start a new company and cut ties with you too. Mary's scream could be heard over the phone. Seizing the phone from Brian, Mary ranted quickly. John, you're joking, right? Are you really going to value Victoria over your own mother and son? That's absurd. You'll regret this. Please reconsider. If I consider how you and Brian have treated Victoria, it seems only fair. You two don't care about me. You're just dazzled by the profits I could generate. John spoke sternly to Mary. Victoria, who isn't even blood related but cares for me, means much more to me than such a family. Wait. Don't hang up. I'll make sure Brian pays back the money he owes Victoria. Just don't abandon me. John hung up in the middle of the conversation and immediately blocked Mary's phone number and messages. Victoria, ignore any messages from those two. Well, yeah. Are we really cutting ties? As I asked anxiously, John affirmed with conviction. It's okay. Like I told mom earlier, I have no intention of getting along with Brian or her after how they've treated you. I'm sorry for making you endure all this. I was too wrapped up in work, making it hard for you to talk to me, right? No, it's okay. From now on, I'll support you even in the parts Mary and Brian were supposed to. Then, John smiled gently at me. After returning to the States, Mary and Brian planned to stay in a hotel for a while to evade the police. However, John informed the police about their favorite hotel, and they were quickly arrested. This time, since I hadn't submitted the forged documents to the authorities, the charges were only attempted forgery of a sealed document, and being their first offense, they were just sternly warned and sent home. However, the news of their arrest spread in the neighborhood, and Mary, who cares deeply about public perception, became too embarrassed to go outside. Moreover, because she embezzled company funds, she was removed from her position as chairperson during the trip, and is now unemployed. When relatives visited Mary's house, they found her confined in a dim room, wearing filthy pajamas, which is a far cry from her fashionable past. Brian, having been kicked out of the house, was also discovered to have borrowed money not only from Mary, but from several relatives, to fund his nightlife. With the relatives now aware that John had cut ties with them, and fearing being defrauded, they demanded immediate repayment from Brian. To prevent him from escaping, one relative allowed him to live at their house and made him work doing odd jobs at their business. They withhold his salary to ensure his debts are paid, as he would likely spend it otherwise. 
now unable to visit his favorite nightclubs and under constant surveillance by his relatives, Brian is in a prickly situation. At work, he is bossed around by employees younger than him. Meanwhile, John, as he declared, started his own company with a few trusted colleagues. I continue to work at the flower shop and occasionally use my flower arrangement skills for decorating venues. At one point, my reputation for good taste led to being invited to decorate venues for John's business partners. It makes me incredibly happy to think that my work contributes to enhancing the image of John's company. Going forward, I look forward to supporting John and continuing my work with pride, side by side. Ladies and gentlemen, I have something important to tell you today. Everyone in the room turned to look at my husband. My wife, Emily, has a debt of $200,000. I am saddened to have such a foolish wife. The relatives around us looked at me with puzzled faces. What did you say? Emily, is that true? My in-laws also looked surprised. However, I was not phased at all. Debt? That's not mine. It's his foolish new brides. I looked into my husband's eyes and said with a snort. My in-laws and other relatives were even more puzzled. What's going on, Emily? John, what's up with you guys? Hey, John. Spit it out. Who's this foolish bride you're talking about? The in-laws pressed us for answers. Then, with an innocent look on his face, my husband began to speak. There's no way I would lie, right? Parents should trust what their son says. Saying that, he pulled a piece of paper from his bag. This is the proof, Emily. You can't run from this. He confidently held up the paper for all to see. It was a promissory note with my name on it. I am Emily, 30 years old. After graduating from high school, I went to a vocational school for video production and have been working as a CG creator at a production company in the city. Two years ago, I reconnected with John, who was in the same class as me in high school. The opportunity came at a reunion marking 10 years since we graduated from high school. During high school, I had no romantic feelings for John. Back then, he was the type to play in the corner of the classroom with a few others. He wasn't a romantic prospect for me. But the John I met after so long seemed like a completely different person. Wait, are you really the same John? You seem like a different person. Do I? I don't think I've changed that much. He had become impressively handsome. At that moment, I fell for him at first sight. I bit the bullet and confessed my feelings to John, and he accepted them. We started living together while we were dating. Then, on my birthday night, he proposed to me. I accepted with a huge smile on my face. Two years have passed since then, and we spent my birthday night together. That day is also our proposal anniversary. John, it's been two years since then. Yale, feels like yesterday. While chatting about this and that, my husband made a suggestion. So, we're going to my folks' place for Christmas, right? Since getting married, I've been going to his parents' house every year with him. But this time, I found it odd and tilted my head. We had been there for Christmas the past two years after all. It was an annual tradition, so it was already expected without him having to mention it. However, he made a point of confirming it with me. It felt less like he was just confirming and more like he had something he wanted to say. 
The next day, while cleaning his room, I found something shocking. What is this? Feeling a surge of anger towards John, I decided to carry out a plan. When Christmas came, we headed to his parents' house together. Using the freeway, it took us about two hours to get there. Hey, Dad, Mom, we're home. John announced loudly as he rang the doorbell. John, you don't need to shout. You've already pressed the bell. He responded seriously. Dad and Mom are hard of hearing lately, so I have to speak up or they won't notice. Indeed, my in-laws were nearing their 70s. It wouldn't be surprising if their hearing had declined, but I felt his way of putting it was a bit too blunt. However, I didn't dwell on it and waited for a response from inside the house. After a while, my in-laws came to greet us. John, it's been a while. Emily, welcome. Come in, come in. We have delicious dishes waiting for you. My in-laws are very kind people. When I got married, I was worried about whether I would get along with them. But such concerns were unnecessary. They welcomed me warmly. There are plenty of stories about difficult relationships with in-laws. But I feel truly blessed to have them. Thinking this, I went with my husband to the living room. There were many of my husband's relatives in the spacious living room. He is the second of four siblings, and that day, everyone had gathered. All four brothers were married. I went around greeting the relatives. Fortunately, they were all very calm and kind, and I've never had any trouble with family relations. After the greetings, I sat down and drank some water brought by my mill. Everyone, please eat your fill. She said while serving the food. I took her up on the offer and started eating the spread of dishes on the table. John was having a good time talking and drinking with his brothers and relatives. I also engaged in lively conversations with the relatives. After some time, John suddenly stood up and announced loudly. Ladies and gentlemen, I have something important to tell you today. Everyone present turned to look at my husband. My wife, Emily, has a debt of $200,000. I am saddened to have such a foolish wife. The relatives around us then looked at me with puzzled expressions. What did you say? Emily, is that true? The in-laws seemed shocked, their eyes wide open. However, I was not phased at all. Debt? That's not mine. It's his foolish new brides. I retorted, laughing through my nose while looking into John's eyes. The in-laws and other relatives looked even more confused. Emily, what in the world are you talking about? John, what's going on? Hey John, come out with it. Who is this foolish bride you're talking about? The in-laws pressed us for answers. Then, with an ineffective expression, my husband began to speak. There's no way I would lie, right? Parents should trust what their son says. He stated, then pulled a piece of paper from his bag. This is the proof, Emily, you can't run from this. He confidently raised a paper high. It was a promissory note with my name on it. Why would you have such a thing? I don't remember signing this. I said truthfully, but I felt cold stares from the relatives. My husband continued. As it stands, I'm considering divorcing Emily. First, be honest and apologize to the relatives here. I sighed deeply. What an impossible person. I murmured, feeling a laugh rise within me. You're right, 
being honest and apologizing is best. But shouldn't that be coming from you, John? John tilted his head at my words. What are you talking about? Are you out of your mind? Only someone unhinged would borrow such a large amount. He scoffed at me. In the next moment, Mill looked at me and said, Emily, what's this about? There's a promissory note, and with all this sudden talk, I'm about to lose my mind. We can't just leave things unclear. I want to hear your side of the story, too. She spoke while looking me straight in the eyes. My Phil had tears in his eyes. Seeing the in-laws like this, my eyes started to well up with tears, too. Feeling guilty about betraying the trust of my in-laws and the other relatives, I stated the facts clearly. I repeat, I did not borrow $200,000. In fact, I don't have any debt at all. That's the truth. After saying this firmly, John next to me slammed his hand on the table. I have something to say. He declared as he stood up. Emily, you've been cheating, haven't you? I was stunned. It was creepy how he confidently brought up such baseless accusations in front of all the relatives. Recently, Emily has been acting strange. She's constantly checking her phone sneakily and has started working more weekends. These are all signs of cheating I read about online. That's why when I did some digging, I found this promissory note. And where did you borrow from? I've never heard of this financial company. I can't live with a woman who deals with loan sharks. I want a divorce. To me, John's story sounded like a joke. He continued. Why are you silent? You're ruining our Christmas with your nonsense. Just admit it, you're swamped in debt. I responded with full force. As you said, it's time to tell the truth. But I've been telling the truth all along. It's John who needs to come clean. He's blown his savings on mobile game microtransactions, leaving his bank account empty. And last year, he got into trouble with payday loans. At this point, John began to look uneasy. But you said borrowing money was fine as long as it got paid back eventually. At my words, John's face turned pale. What are you talking about? I don't remember doing such things. John's words had lost their bravado from earlier. My in-laws and other relatives looked at him skeptically. Let me explain the sequence of John's debts. It all started last winter when he apparently made one microtransaction after another, close to $10,000, I suppose. At this moment, the relatives murmured among themselves. It's often heard in the news about excessive spending on games, but they probably never expected it to be true for someone in their family. John's income is slightly above average for his age, and we could live comfortably under normal circumstances. But with that level of spending on games, financial strain was inevitable. He didn't stop at his own savings, but even considered dipping into our household funds. Murmurs arose again among the relatives. John's face turned pale as he avoided eye contact. That's when I warned John not to touch our household money. He respected that, but he continued borrowing from payday lenders to fund his gaming habit. I explicitly told him I would never cover his debts, and I even put it in writing. But it seems he grew tired of the game and stopped making in-game purchases. I wonder if it's right to continue living under the same roof with John. At that time, I was really struggling with these thoughts. I continued. Last summer, the problem arose again. John was coming home late, so I did some digging. It turned out he was taking his colleagues to hostess bars, claiming he would foot the bill. I said this while looking into John's eyes. 
I had never discussed this matter with him before. His eyes widened in shock. How do you know I was frequenting hostess bars and treating my colleagues? That's not all. John, I know about the affair you had with a girl you met at the bar. At that moment, the room buzzed again. The in-laws looked sharply at John. He turned pale and retorted. It's my right to spend the money I earn however I want. I couldn't trust John's statements that he would repay the debts without bothering me. You want to divorce me to remarry that woman, right? I also know that you've accumulated a significant amount of debt to lavish money on that woman. The promissory note was fabricated for that reason. I don't recall signing any notes. Besides, forging a promissory note is a crime. John was left gaping, speechless. John, you said earlier you were considering divorcing me. I agree with that decision. Then I pulled out a large envelope from my bag. I've done some thorough investigation beforehand, so let me present you with the concrete evidence. I took out documents and photos from the envelope, explaining them so that all the relatives could see. I had previously hired a detective agency because I had been suspicious of my husband's activities. As a result, he was having an affair. There were numerous photos clearly showing him in intimate situations with another woman. Furthermore, he had borrowed $200,000 to lavish on this woman. I confronted the relatives with these results. As expected, John didn't stay silent. You can't trust such a shady detective agency. That could be a doctored photo. Emily is a CG creator. After all, she could have manipulated various photos to frame me. I have the promissory note here. Then John thrust a promissory note at me. So, you're saying the detective agency can't be trusted. Then what is this? I presented something in front of him. Oh, that is. John stammered. What I had found while cleaning his room after my birthday was an unfinished divorce petition and a marriage registration form. The in-laws were quite shocked by this. The marriage registration already had another woman's name and personal information filled in. I was surprised at how prepared you were, not just divorcing me, but you already have your next marriage lined up. And to think I had these papers for nearly a week and you didn't notice at all. You're quite oblivious. Aren't these marriage papers important to you? You should have some sense of crisis management. John looked down and fell silent. I apologized to the relatives and left the scene. Later, we decided to have a discussion including the in-laws about the debts and the divorce. A few weeks later, John and I, along with the in-laws, gathered again at his parents' house. The moment everyone sat down, John glared at me. Just apologize to me. Then we wouldn't have to deal with all this mess. He clearly hadn't learned his lesson. What are you talking about? Shouldn't you be the one apologizing? John retorted sharply to my words. You're spouting nonsense, trying to make me out to be a criminal. That's enough. I said, letting out a big sigh. Fine, let's clear this up. I said and called someone from the next room. Nice to meet you. I'm the attorney, Michael Smith. John looked at him with wide eyes. I've been consulting with Emily about a divorce. Probably what John was worried about, Emily's working on weekends, was because she was meeting at the detective agency for an investigation. Thanks to Emily's cooperation, we've been able to gather a lot of evidence about John's affair. John turned pale. The attorney proceeded. Furthermore, when we showed the promissory note John had to a document examiner, it was proven to be fake. Here are the results. 
The attorney showed the report in front of the in-laws. It clearly stated that the promissory note was forged. The in-laws looked at John with disdain. This proves John was lying. It's disgraceful that my son would forge a promissory note. My mill said that with a look about to cry. And my Phil exclaimed. You're a disgrace to our family. You need to pay for your sins. John, in surprise, spoke to his father. Dad, I'm not guilty. I'm innocent. There was no sympathy for John, who spoke in desperation. Then, my Phil stood up and was about to hit John. My mill and I managed to calm him down. Afterward, I made a declaration to the in-laws. I'm the only victim here, so could you please leave matters concerning John to me and the attorney? I asked while the attorney next to me made eye contact with the in-laws. Emily, John has really troubled you, hasn't he? I apologize on behalf of my son. My mill said so and apologized to me. And my Phil was still red-faced and angry. Such a disgraceful son. Forging a promissory note is unbelievable. I felt that my father-in-law's words were filled with anger and love. Eventually, through dealings with the attorney, my innocence was proven. John and I got divorced, and the in-laws, along with the rest of the family, cut ties with him. John was left with debts and no one to rely on. Though we could have sued him for forgery, John declared to the attorney and me that he would repay the borrowed money himself, so I decided not to press charges. Meanwhile, the ordeal had stressed me out, and I ended up needing psychiatric care for a while. I took a month off work, but my understanding boss approved my leave. During my recovery, John's parents contacted me. We've explained everything to our family. So don't worry. If you need anything, feel free to rely on us. John's parents' words encouraged me. Since returning to work, I've been working hard every day. However, I still occasionally have nightmares about John. Recovering from the mental shock will probably take time. I still visit the hospital every two months. After all, it was a deep betrayal by someone I once loved deeply. Yet, I felt saved by the kindness of my in-laws. And the people at my workplace were very understanding. I'm really grateful for this because mental matters aren't easily understood by others. Rumors say that John, my ex-husband, has quit his job. The scandal seemed to have spread through his company leaving him with no place there. He's now working part-time jobs from morning till night to pay off his debts. Moreover, his affair partner left him after finding out about his debts. It serves him right. Since returning to work, I've been involved in a project as a CG creator for a new animated series. I'm really excited about this highly anticipated work. For now, I've decided to prioritize my work over romantic relationships. I'm determined to diligently handle the tasks before me at my own pace. We'll clear this place and turn it into a B&B. &B. My husband David said it, and both Emily and I exclaimed in surprise. What? What are you talking about? At the same time as the shock, we were certain that the scene before us was undoubtedly the site where my parents' home had been demolished. Hey, can you explain this to us in a way we can understand? Is this your doing? I pressed David, who was still smirking, with a stronger tone of voice. Seeing David like that, 
My daughter Emily suddenly burst out laughing. Wait a minute. Stop it. Stop it, Dad. It seems like she's filled with a mix of pity and amusement from the absurd and ridiculous behavior of her father, who has been holding her back all this time. Gasping for breath, Emily continued. Grandpa's house was worth a fortune, you know. Emily said that, then suddenly turned serious. That's like, totally criminal, right? Upon hearing his daughter's words, David realized too late the irreversible mistake he had made. My name is Sarah Brightman. I'm a 48-year-old housewife. Currently, I live with my husband, David, and our only daughter, Emily. Emily is 19 and a freshman in college, but it seems she has no plans to move out anytime soon. Being women, it's been a blessing that Emily, who has been on my side since childhood, is still with us at home. That's also because we have a common enemy, David, which makes it even more so. David and I met when I was still working as an office employee. After graduating from community college, I worked as an administrative assistant at a local trading company. David, who was in sales at another company, was a frequent visitor there. Though sales sounds impressive, David had a job that was like being a general errand runner, going around different companies. He always had a friendly demeanor, even towards me, an administrative assistant, and I didn't form a negative impression of him. As we saw each other weekly, we started chatting and eventually became close. As I thought, David was being exploited like being a general errand runner at his company, and his earnings were modest. But perhaps because I was still young, I was fully convinced that love would conquer all. For a while, I continued working and supporting our home, but I quit my job when I became pregnant. David wanted me to focus on childcare expressing his wish for me to stay at home. When Emily was born, naturally, my workload increased. In place of David, who was out working during the day, I had to take care of Emily, cook, do the laundry, and clean all by myself. I managed to get through those days, but by the time Emily entered kindergarten, David's attitude towards me had changed. Taking advantage of my silence, David's behavior became increasingly overbearing. At the company, David was ridiculed by everyone and taken advantage of. It turns out I was his outlet for relieving this frustration. He wasn't so self-deprecating when we first met. But perhaps there was a problem with me sympathizing with David too much. The people at work just dump all their troubles on David. They don't recognize your abilities. I think you shouldn't worry about it. I meant it as consolation, but this gave David a twisted confidence. Do you also think you're better than me, that you can belittle me? Whenever I tried to offer even a slight critique, David would fly into a rage. This wore me down, and I found myself unable to say anything. My actions, accumulated over time, certainly contributed to David's increasing arrogance. Enduring it for the sake of our daughter has undoubtedly led to our current marital situation. However, I was only trying to be a kind wife and did nothing blameworthy. Upon closer reflection, it's all quite absurd, but the thought of for the sake of my daughter is what stops my train of thought. As we got older, 
our marital problems only twisted further. Although I remain a housewife, in society, there's things about age-appropriate roles and status. Such thoughts, even if unspoken, can be conveyed through behavior. David, overly sensitive to such external perceptions, let them exacerbate his negativity. He became more self-deprecating, making conversations with him incredibly draining. I hadn't noticed before we were married, but it seems this aspect of his personality hasn't changed since childhood, and David appears to have no friends. At our wedding, only David's relatives were present, and there were no friends. I didn't think much of it at the time, but upon reflection, it's a strange situation indeed. I still regret not noticing these finer points of David's behavior while we were dating. Certainly, compared to the general public, David's position at his company was low, but there are many in similar situations. I can understand being bothered if one is nagged by family upon returning home, but I never once complained to David about such matters. Therefore, no matter what I did, David's attitude remained unchanged. Originally shy, David never vented his stress outside. Instead, it was all directed at me and our daughter, Emily. His drinking increased day by day, and with each drink, he would loudly rampage, breaking things around the house. Although he never physically harmed us, the exchange of hurtful words escalated. Do you realize who you owe your college education to? Always clinging to your mom. Think properly about who you should be grateful to. It's often heard that teenage daughters despise their fathers, but Emily had solid reasons for disliking David. Enduring such irrational scoldings daily, it's only natural she would feel this way. When David was not around, Emily and I would share our grievances with each other to get through the day. During this time, my father, who lived in the same state, fell ill. Since my mother had passed away a few years earlier, he was living alone in my childhood home. My brother, John, who runs a business in the city, was busy, so it fell upon me to check on our father. The diagnosis he received at the hospital wasn't exactly cause for celebration. I blamed myself for not noticing sooner. Despite being aware of his condition, my father, not wanting to worry John or me, who both had our own families, kept silent Following discussions with the doctor, it was decided that he would be admitted to the hospital and receive continued treatment to the fullest extent possible. Still, it was clear that his condition was worsening day by day, prompting John to frequently leave his business to visit him. I was bracing myself for what was to come. Of course, my days were filled with visits to the hospital. Even as a housewife, managing all the household duties as before was no longer feasible. Emily visited her grandfather a few times, willingly helping me out. But David was not pleased with this. Have you been using more TV dinner lately? Your whole mall day, there's no need for frozen food right and relying on your daughter only now you should consider our life here too he took the opportunity to scold me and at the same time speak ill of my father after all the care my father had provided how could he say such things had he forgotten how much trouble he had caused my father there was a time when David's earnings were not enough to support us, 
especially after Emily was born. And our living costs increased as I left my job to focus on child care, according to David's wishes. It was an inevitable outcome. Yet David, unapologetically, pressured me to manage somehow. Out of options, I explained the situation to my father, who quietly helped us with financial support without saying a word, even knowing David's circumstances. Unaware of my father's feelings, David took this for granted and relied on his generosity for a while. Although David's income eventually increased slightly, he never expressed gratitude to my father. To avoid upsetting David, I dodged the topic and continued my visits to my father. However, soon after, my father's condition dramatically worsened, and he passed away. Emily and I were overwhelmed by a profound sense of loss, but there were still many tasks to handle. Arranging various documents, preparing for the funeral, just thinking about it made my head spin, but staying busy helped distract my mind. While I was nearby, unaware to me, David muttered, Finally, we can have a decent meal. His insensitive remark irritated me, but I lacked the energy to argue and just swallowed my words. Even though my father's funeral had concluded, my emotions were still heavy. It was unusual to see David showing a cooperative attitude in sorting out the belongings of my childhood home. Perhaps reflecting on his past behavior, he actively helped with cleaning up the house. I've gathered the papers, but is this everything here? His words reminded me of the safe my father had tucked away in the closet, and I asked David to check its contents too. I remembered that I had received the key to the safe when my father was hospitalized and handed the small key to David. This was all that was in the safe. David said, handing me some old bills and a family tree document he retrieved from it. I hadn't expected much, but since he had made a point of handing me the key, I thought there might be something more valuable inside. That's why I was disappointed by the contents of the safe handed over from David. I shrugged it off, thinking that's just how it goes, and decided to return to the remaining sorting tasks. The cleanup didn't finish that day. But over the next few days, we completed tidying up my childhood home. Finally able to catch my breath, I was overwhelmed with immense fatigue. At that time, I received a call from my brother, who had returned to New York. I'm really sorry for leaving all the cleanup to you. If there's anything I can do, please let me know. He repeatedly expressed his gratitude before getting to the point. By the way, was there a property deed for the family home among the documents did kept? It might seem underhanded to ask about this after dad's gone, but there's something I need to discuss with you, Sarah. Upon saying that, my brother began talking about the inheritance of our father's estate. My brother, who runs a company that ventures into various businesses, was also considering entering the food and beverage industry. He wanted the rights to our family home for that purpose. I vaguely remember being told as a child that our house had cultural value. The building had a unique design, and now that I think about it, it had the vibe of a trendy old farmhouse cafe that's been popular lately. It seems his plan was to use our family home as it is for a cafe. Actually, I had gotten permission from Dad a long time ago, 
He had told me that everything else would go to you, Sarah. I know it's late, but could you agree to this plan? My brother has always been fond of me since we were kids, and he's still single. I don't think he's after a large share of the inheritance for himself. I am well aware that he has more than enough savings. I wouldn't know what to do with the family home myself, and if you're okay with it, John. I honestly agreed with my brother's wishes and decided to transfer the rights to the family home to him. Even if I continue to manage it, it would eventually have to be demolished. It's better for my brother to make good use of it and keep our family home standing. Thank you, then. Could you look for the property deed among the documents Dad left? David had gathered the documents in one place, so it should be among them. I told John I would contact him as soon as I found the documents and ended the call Come to think of it, I haven't looked at those documents since then. They should be in a clear folder, I believe. Recalling the case David had given me with the documents inside, I searched through it. However, no matter how much I searched, I couldn't find a property deed to the family home that my brother mentioned. That's weird. I put all the documents here. Could they still be at the family home? I was suddenly alarmed at the thought that I might have accidentally thrown them away, but I wouldn't know until I visited the family home. Not wanting to live with this anxiety, I decided to go there immediately to check. Arriving at the family home, I couldn't believe my eyes. At the location where the family home once stood, there were countless debris scattered around, indicating it has been demolished. Did I take a wrong turn somewhere? But no, that can't be right. In a panic, I called Emily to explain the situation. About my brother's plans to turn the family home into a cafe and its cultural value. Sensing my distress, Emily said, I'm coming right now, and hon up. True to her word, Emily soon rushed to my location. Mom, what happened? She seemed to have hurried, her long hair wildly disheveled. Breathless, Emily looked at me with concern. The family house, I can't seem to find it anymore. As I explained the situation to Emily over and over, I gradually began to calm down. You're not wrong, Mom. This is definitely Grandpa's place. As Emily said, the fact that she came straight here means this is undoubtedly where my parents' home stood. Or rather, where it used to be. It's only been a few weeks since my father's funeral. I can't begin to guess what happened. Could my brother know something about this? But we were just on the phone a while ago. That can't be possible. This makes the reason for the demolition of the family home even more puzzling. From the look of the site, it seemed like the work was still in progress, but no one was in sight as far as I could see. What should I do in this situation? Call the police. I tried to calm my head, which was once again in confusion, while also listening to Emily's opinion. Then, from a distance, I saw someone walking towards us. Is that? Could that be Dad walking towards us? Emily exclaimed in surprise. I squinted at the approaching figure to confirm. Indeed, it was David. Sloppily dressed in a suit, staggering towards us. It's just after 3 p.m. Now. Is he on his way back from his rounds? 
Still, it's odd to run into him here by chance. My confusion deepened with David's arrival, and all I could do was wait for him to speak. As David got closer, I could see a smug smile forming on his face. Despite him being my husband, the sight sent a chill through my body. Oh, both of you are right here. David said with a smirk, stopping in front of me and Emily. Neither Emily nor I could open our mouths due to the strangeness of the situation, waiting for David to explain. We're gonna clear this place and turn it into a bed and breakfast. At David's words, Emily and I exclaimed in surprise simultaneously. What? What are you talking about? With the shock, we were certain that the scene before us was undoubtedly where the family home had been demolished. But there's no way we could just accept it with a yes, okay. What on earth was David thinking? Even as my mind raced to understand his true intentions, I couldn't grasp any answer. Can you explain to us in a way that we can understand? Is this your doing? I pressed David, who was still smirking, with a stronger tone of voice. Yeah, I did it all. We need to clear the place first to move forward. I plan to build the B and B with the savings I've accumulated and my retirement pay. Of course, I'll need you to chip in too. David spoke in a somewhat grandiose manner, showing no remorse. Could there possibly be a valid reason for this outrageous act? David seemed to be somewhat irritated by the angry and confused expressions on the faces of me and Emily. With a resigned attitude, he continued. I've been wanting to start something on my own for a while now. Everyone just keeps bossing me around without recognizing my talents. I'm not okay with that. So, I've decided to run a B and be here. David stated confidently, then once again gauged our reactions. However, such an explanation only deepened our confusion. I'm sorry, I have no idea what you're trying to say. I admitted, as fear began to spread within me due to his incomprehensible behavior. I just quit my job told off all those annoying people and slammed down my resignation. The timing of Dad's passing is a message to me. It's time for me to take charge. David ranted in an excited state. Though his words were disjointed, his intention was clear. He planned to leave his job and start running a bed and breakfast. To be in charge without anyone criticizing him, to lead his life his way. Turning this into a B&B, &B, you know this land belongs to Dad and my brother, right? You think it's okay to do this without permission? It seemed Dad had always talked about transferring the rights to the family home and land to my brother so it cannot be that those rights had been passed to David. It was unthinkable that my brother was deceiving me, and it's not normal for a husband to quit his job and demolish the family home without consulting his wife. Permission or not, I have the property deed. Being entrusted with the estate cleanup means we can do what we want with what's left, right? There's nothing to forgive or not. I'm your husband. David responded, seemingly without any guilt, lecturing me and Emily. That makes no sense at all. I shouted as soon as David finished speaking. His utterly selfish and childish logic was too much for me to bear. 
This is my father's house, inherited by me and my brother. How can you, who are not even blood-related, do this on your own? David seemed to realize the seriousness of the matter after my scolding. Although his smug smile briefly faded, only to quickly return as he justified his actions again. What kind of way is that to talk to your husband? Who do you think has provided for you all this time? You two should just quietly follow what I say. David, face red with anger, raised his voice without restraint. He was panting heavily, perhaps from the overwhelming excitement. Watching David's behavior, Emily suddenly burst into laughter. Hold on, stop it, Dad. Tears were even appearing in Emily's eyes. It seems like she's filled with a mix of pity and amusement from the absurd and ridiculous behavior of her father, who has been holding her back all this time. Dad, don't you know? Gasping for breath, Emily spoke to David, who was intently watching her. Grandpa's house was worth a lot, you know, you just destroyed the house Uncle John got. Emily then suddenly became serious again. That's like, totally criminal, right? David's face rapidly drained of color, perhaps becoming sobered by his college-age daughter's remark. What are you talking about? How can you say such things to your father? He raised his voice, but it lacked any real force or authority. It seemed he was somewhere aware of his mistake. He tried to push through with it in the heat of the moment, but once his daughter said it, there was no turning back. Neither my brother nor I could ever condone such an act. I'll contact John for now. The cafe project should be underway. David knew my brother ran a business, so my words alone were enough for him to grasp the situation. What? That's bad. There's media coverage, and contracts are already advancing. I'll call back later, but please don't do anything more with that place. My brother sounded panicked as he hung up after hearing my explanation. Just make sure nothing more is done. This has turned into a huge mess. From the sound of my brother's voice over the phone, both Emily and David's faces contorted. It seemed David had been plotting to build a bed and breakfast here ever since he said he would clean up the estate. He helped with the family home's cleanup, intending to find the property deed. I didn't know about turning this house into a cafe. Isn't it common sense to mention such important things in advance? Though David's face had turned pale earlier, he now started shifting the blame onto me and my brother. His face returning to its usual defiance, acting as if he had done nothing wrong. Anyway, don't do anything more. Right now, my brother is hurriedly contacting his business partners. Dumbfounded by David's audacity, I decided to wait for my brother's call. Then I noticed a man in a suit running towards us from across the street. Excuse me, are you Mrs. Sarah Brightman? The man, who offered his business card, turned out to be my brother's secretary. He had been sent from my brother's company in New York for the cafe opening and had rushed here after hearing about the situation at the family home. I was just in a meeting with the president of the company collaborating on this cafe project. The president is hurrying over here, but the business party is very upset. After checking David's face, the secretary continued. I've heard the gist from the president, but it seems there will be significant liability for damages, even if you are his sister's husband. 
you will have to bear those responsibilities. Until now, David might have felt detached from reality, only being reprimanded by Emily and me. Hearing the word liability from a stranger in a suit, David's face turned pale again. Mom, can we afford to pay that? What's going to happen to us? Emily's soft mutter seemed to be the last straw, and David just slumped to the ground. Supporting David's limp body, we decided to head back home for the time being. We invited the secretary into our home and waited for my brother's arrival from New York. We understood the gravity of the situation, but were powerless to do anything on our own. As the frustrating hours passed and night fell, my brother finally came to see us. Sarah, I'm sorry, but David will have to take appropriate responsibility. My brother said soberly before starting to explain the current situation. The project to open a cafe using the family home had started some time after our father passed away. My brother's company is well known in the industry, and its business party had eagerly commenced work on the proposal brought by my brother. That meant they had halted their ongoing projects to put all their efforts into this joint venture with my brother. It was clear that canceling the cafe project now would result in tremendous losses. My brother was trying everything possible to keep the project alive. But if the family home itself has been demolished, I couldn't help but blurt out words as I recalled the scene that was right in front of me just moments ago. I just cite myself earlier, and it was definitely a sloppy demolition job. It might take time, but since the materials are still there, we might be able to restore it. My brother sighed deeply as he spoke, his face still stern. David, I didn't want to say this, but what you did is a crime. It's not something that can be simply apologized for, but you will be joining me on an apology process. David, still pale, seemed frozen in place, but slowly nodded in acknowledgement. Just a few hours ago, he was so proud, talking about his future plans, but now, not a trace of that remained. I felt utterly embarrassed to expose such a disgraceful side of my husband in front of my brother. My lack of judgment has led to this dire situation. While my brother wouldn't blame me, I had no intention of staying with David any longer. On paper, David and I were still married, but to me, he had become a complete stranger. Accompanied by my brother and the secretary, David faced an unimaginable reprimand during the apology process to the associated companies. To explain the situation, the truth had to be told. When my brother disclosed the full story to them, those who were calm with my brother turned their criticism unanimously towards David. David had believed his lack of recognition was due to others, but facing direct condemnation like you're finished as a person, his spirit easily crumbled. When brought back home by my brother, his eyes were vacant, looking like he might collapse at any moment. Fortunately, everyone accepted the apology, considering my reputation but of course, after taking on the appropriate compensation responsibilities. David, following my brother, must have heard enough about the specific amount of damages. It was understandable for that to overwhelm his thoughts. However, I had also reached my limit. I pushed the documents I had prepared in front of David, who was sitting down, now you finally understand why you're not valued, right? You are a failure as a person, 
my patience has run out. I clearly declared to David, urging him to sign the divorce papers. Upon hearing this from his wife, who had always been compliant, David started to cry. Please, don't abandon me. What's going to happen to me like this? I quit my job, you know. We've been living together all this time. We're family, aren't we? Considering he had never really thought about us except as an outlet for his stress, his seemingly reasonable words now had no impact on me. Ignoring David's pleas, I continued to stare at the divorce papers. Speaking up wouldn't mean anything at this point, nor would it benefit David. After a while, sensing my resolute decision, David slowly signed. It was over now. David and I officially became strangers. Months later, thanks to my brother's generosity, David avoided criminal charges, but he was left with enormous debt. He took on the liability for the halted project and, due to our divorce, was also ordered to pay alimony for his arbitrary actions and verbal abuse. It was a predictable outcome, yet David failed to foresee it. How many people did he inconvenience with his thoughtless actions? The apology process with my brother must have made him fully realize it. Fortunately, his resignation wasn't taken seriously by his boss, so he didn't lose his job, which would have been his only means of repaying the massive debt. The workplace environment would be harsher, but he was lucky to be forgiven for his outrageous actions. David lost his family and assets, and his pride in his supposed excellence was shattered. This would be the greatest punishment for him. I worried about the impact of our divorce on Emily, but she was already an adult. She seemed to take things less heavily than I had feared. With mom around, I'll be fine, and I'm an adult now. Emily said cheerfully, perhaps to comfort me. My brother's project to renovate and rebuild the family home managed to recover. Though the alimony from David and the inheritance from our father meant we could get by, I ended up being entrusted with running my brother's cafe. The people from the Business Associate Company that launched the cafe with my brother trusted me and delegated various tasks to me. Thanks to this, I'm living a more fulfilling life than during my days as a housewife. Being able to work where I lived with my parents and brother brings me great joy. Marriage isn't the only source of happiness in life. I might have lost a sense of security that comes from being cared for by someone, but in another way, it means I've gained freedom. Now I don't feel gloomy. On the contrary, I am more optimistic and cheerful. I have found new purpose and am filled with hope. My name is Mary. I'm a 29-year-old stay-at-home wife. My husband, John, and I have been married for five years. We don't have any children yet. I met John through my father's introduction. John worked at a company that my father had introduced him to. Originally, John worked at one of my father's client companies, but my father appreciated his sales skills and poached him to his own company. From there, John became a direct subordinate of my father, and through repeated social gatherings, we got to know each other beyond work, which led to my father suggesting me to John. When I first met John, I was captivated by his charm and struck by him. After a peaceful courtship, we married five years ago. However, lately, our relationship had begun to sour a bit. 
I guess this is inevitable after being together this long as a couple. Despite thinking this, the idea of separating never crossed my mind, and I continued my daily life routinely. One day, after John returned from work, I mustered up the courage to make a bold statement. Hey, don't you think our conversations have decreased lately? We also go out less. How about we take some time and go on a trip? Maybe a trip down memory lane. Going to some nice places to eat. Sorry, I can't afford that. Really? But? After being married for five years, isn't this what all couples are like? Look, I'm tired. I'm going to sleep. That day ended with just that curt remark from John. I guess that's how it is. I can understand becoming curt after five years together, but gradually, due to work stress and personal dissatisfaction, John began to look outward, and our relationship grew even colder. I was aware of the problem but struggled to find a solution. However, one day, John made an unexpected remark. Hey, how about we move to a new house soon? What? I was honestly surprised. But at the same time, I harbored hope that a new environment might improve our marriage. Yeah, yeah. See, this apartment would be too small if we had kids, and it's far from the supermarket and schools. I was thinking it'd be better if I was closer to work. You were thinking that? Of course. That's why I've been working so hard. Thank you. All right, let's go check out some properties soon. Sounds good. I was touched by John's words. He even considered having children. For the first time in a long while, I felt uplifted. From the next day, we were able to start living with a sense of freshness. A year passed, and we finally got our dream newly built house. As a couple, we started preparing for the move, and our conversations became as lively as when we first started dating. We discussed furniture and appliances for our new home, sharing each other's interests and thoughts. John passionately talked about the living room sofa, emphasizing both comfort and style. Meanwhile, I took an interest in the kitchen setup, wanting to create a space that was easy to cook in and maintained a sense of cleanliness. Through these exchanges, I came to deeply understand our lifestyles and values and selecting furniture and appliances for our new home took on a meaning beyond just buying things. I hoped we might recapture the happy times we had when we first met, but that happy time was short-lived. We had just comfortably settled into our new home and were getting used to our new life. One peaceful evening, as John and I were relaxing in the living room. Hey, I'm going to live here with my mistress, Anna and our love child. What? Thrown into confusion by his sudden announcement, I was stunned. Are you listening? I'll give you a week to move out because I'm going to live here with my mistress, Anna, and our love child. A love child? What? John's heartless words froze my heart in an instant, and I was at a loss for words. Wait, wait a minute? What do you mean? I don't understand. Explain it to me properly. John met Anna at his workplace. Anna has been working part-time at John's company. Over the past two years, their relationship had evolved beyond mere co-workers to one of mutual love. Hey, I actually have something to report. What's up? I've been thinking lately that we might need a bigger place. A bigger place? What do you mean? Yeah, because, you know, I'm pregnant with your child, so I felt our current home is a bit cramped and I want our child to grow up in a bigger space. Really? Yeah, for Rayal. So I was thinking we should move to a bigger house and live a happy life together. I see. Could you give me a moment to think about it? Eventually, they nurtured their love and even had a child. John told me about the conversation from two years ago between him and his mistress. Wait, so what about us? We'll divorce. Come on, let's go to the courthouse. What? 
What are you saying? Weren't we supposed to live here? We picked out furniture together. No way. I moved here to live with Anna and the love child. So, please, move out as soon as possible. What? That's not right. It wasn't with you. I've realized it. Understand. What's the reason? Why did it turn out like this? Living with you forever would be boring. You're of no use in my life. And you have no value to brag about. Anna seems more fun. And I can't stand being with you anymore. Basically, you're just a burden. You thought that? But we can still reconsider, right? I've thought it over. Anna should be my priority. She's reliable, good at her job, and above all, young and beautiful. Unlike you, I can brag about her. So please understand. I don't want a long discussion. That's all. There's nothing more to talk about with you. Also, the baby has started crawling recently. So, I'm glad we moved to a bigger house. The new house is perfect for the child to play. And I'm looking forward to my new life with Anna. So that's why. You specifically picked the house to meet the needs of the child. Since we had the child, our happiness as a family has increased significantly. And I feel like I can work even harder from now on. You were thinking that. You're the worst. After weighing whether to spend my time with you or with Anna and the love child, I decided I'd be happier living in this new house with Anna and the love child. Does that make sense? As John spoke calmly, I couldn't keep up with his reasoning. I desperately tried to organize my thoughts. We were about to live here together happily, but John has Anna and even a child, and now I have to leave here within a week. Hey, are you listening? Can you leave soon? I've already told Anna she can live here. I need you to move out within a week. I know it's tough, but please understand. It's partly your fault for not satisfying me as a woman. I thought our relationship with Anna might be discovered, but I was surprised it never was. You should be more devoted to the next man you date. You were so dull. That? That's because I was busy with household chores. That's an excuse. You were so boring that it even affected my work. A woman must satisfy her man, or it impacts his work. Success at work depends on the joy at home. Remember that. That's unreasonable. I understand I must satisfy you as my husband, but it's unfair to blame everything on me just because you're bored. If you think it's boring, that's on you. No matter how hard I try, there's nothing I can do if you can entertain yourself. I've been trying hard too, so it's unfair to say such unreasonable things. Well, what? Are you snapping at me? Give me a break. I'm the one who's earned everything. The house and the car, all bought with my earnings. You've been able to live because of me. First of all, you should be thankful for that. Are you serious? Our argument heated up more and more. Gradually, we strayed from the original point of discussion. Okay, I get it. I understand. Yes, yes. I'll leave. Oh, I'm glad you got it. While feeling despair and betrayal, I left the scene, a place that seemed like a crushing nightmare. I couldn't tell anyone around me and spent two days thinking it over alone in a motel. I'll definitely get revenge. That was my resolve. Suddenly, a certain person flashed through my mind. Three days later. Whoa, are you actually leaving? Yes, I am. Lucky me, that helps. I'll let Anna know she can move in tomorrow. Just then, the doorbell rang. Huh? Who's that? The doorbell rang. Could you please get the door? What? Get it yourself? Please. Fuck. Fine, since you're leaving today anyway. I allowed a faint smile to appear. When John went out, there stood an elderly man next to a luxury car that seemed out of place in the neighborhood. John was surprised but approached the elderly man. Hello. What can I do for you? 
The elderly man, with a dignified demeanor despite his surprise, moved closer to John. Are you Mary's husband, John? Yes. Well, yes, but who are you? Here, take this. What's this? A divorce paper and our resignation letter. Sign here immediately. John, shocked and confused, looked bewildered. Ah, uh, no, who are you? What do you want all of a sudden? Resignation letter. What does that mean? Don't you understand why you need to write a resignation letter? The elderly man's voice was stern as he stared down at John. Ah. Uh. Old man, what's this about? Got the wrong house. Or is your mind slipping in your old age? I quickly ran up to them. Ah, Grandpa, thank you for coming today. What, Grandpa? Hey, Mary, what's this about? Ah, uh, let me introduce him. This is my grandfather. And why do I need to give Mary's grandfather a resignation letter? Ah, uh, didn't I tell you? It seems familiar. See, got it now. He's the chairman of your company. Yes, the certain person is my grandfather, and he is the chairman of the company where John works. Wait, hold on. You mean, the chairman of my company is Mary's grandpa, really? That's what I'm saying. Well, you wouldn't know by looking, we don't look alike. But I was introduced to this company by Mary's father. Right. What does that have to do with your grandfather? Mary's father's company is a client of my company. John had never met my grandfather at the company. They had only greeted each other once in private. So John had no idea that the chairman was my grandfather. Only my father, who introduced John to the company. And I knew about this. Do you understand what you've done to my beloved granddaughter, Mary? No, that's not it. Not it? I've heard all about what you did from Mary. It's a misunderstanding. John held the two documents forcefully handed to him by my grandfather, trembling as he gripped the pen. Once you've finished writing, we'll be done. Wait. Mary, there's more I need to say. What? You wanted me to leave quickly, didn't you? I stood beside John as he wrote the resignation letter, never making eye contact with him, giving him the cold shoulder and turning my back to him. John stopped writing for a moment and sighed deeply. His heart was full of conflict, but at the same time, he was acutely aware of his own guilt. I almost burst out laughing at the sight and struggled to hold it in. No, sorry. I couldn't help it. Mary, I'm truly, truly sorry. Please reconsider. I take back what I said before. I don't love Anna. I love you more. You feel the same, right? You still love me, don't you? Right? Rose, no matter what you say, it's impossible. I can't believe I even thought you wouldn't cheat, let alone have a child with someone else. It's over. I can ever love someone like you, no matter what happens. So, so then, right here, right now, I'll call Anna and break up with her. Will you stay with me then? No, 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 you don't have to break up for my sake, and I have no intention of being with you. After everything you've done, I can understand how you think you're still loved. How can you even think like that? After a moment of silence. John suddenly changed his tone. What? Acting all high and mighty just because I'm being humble. Don't mess with me. Who would love a conceited woman like you? I thought you were cute at first, but living together, you're nagging, your cooking is mediocre, and your conversation is boring. You should be thankful you got to spend five years with someone like me. Just get out of this house right now. Anna is much better than you in every way. Just moments ago, John was pleading not to break up. But when faced with rejection, he lashed out in anger. He must have thought he could easily reconcile with me. 
but I have a grandfather who protects me, and I am confident I can handle someone like him alone. I had taken martial arts classes. Don't underestimate yourself because you're a woman. Be strong. Those were the words my grandfather told me when I was young. He taught me that I must be able to defend myself. You really are crazy. Your emotions change too quickly, don't they? It's amazing you could even date Anna. Well, you're good at lying, I guess. I was fooled by that too. Oh, right. I had it checked out. You've been acting single around Anna, haven't you? How do you know that? Idiot. Didn't I say? My grandfather is the chairman of your company. I asked Grandpa to look into you and Anna. Way to go, my granddaughter. You're not beaten. Look, mister. When we checked, a lot came up. Despite having Mary, you were fooling around with Anna who works at our company, and you've been causing problems by hitting on married women. I was so embarrassed when I found out one of my employees was doing this. I wondered why I didn't fire him sooner. Really laughable. I'm ashamed I chose someone like you. You're a lost cause. Listening to our conversation, John was despairing. However, my anger had not subsided at all. Well, it depends on how Anna reacts next. Actually, she's about to come here soon. I've already called her on your phone when you were in the bathroom. At that moment, the doorbell rang again. I opened a front door excitedly. There stood Anna and the love child. They were shocked to see me and stood frozen. Ah, uh, my mistake. Sorry. I stopped Anna and the child as they started to leave and spoke to them. You're not mistaken. Nice to meet you. Hello. This is your home. I've been waiting for you. Come on in. Grandpa, could you please take care of this baby in the other room? Can I also speak a bit? Oh, really? Okay. You knew we were married, right, Anna? Uh, no. Yes. Look, it's out in the open now. Why not speak clearly? I knew. I'm sorry, but it's not my fault. First, can you stop that annoying way of talking? Just listening to it irritates me. Um, I'm sorry. You were in an affair, right? I don't know who seduced whom, but it was that kind of relationship, right? Both of you are equally responsible. Um, uh, sorry, who might you be? And I looked at my grandfather with a puzzled expression. Ah, uh, I didn't mention. Don't tell me you didn't know either. He's the chairman of the company you work for, and my grandpa. What? What does that mean? John, did you know? No way. I just found out too. If my face isn't known to this extent, it's rather embarrassing for me. So, I knew you two were having an affair before the divorce. I've got the evidence too. Grandpa, could you please show them? All right. Then, my grandfather took out some photographs from an envelope. Wow, what's this? Entering and leaving the hotel, huh? It's pretty clear from these that you two are more than just senior and junior colleagues. It's bad news for a married person to have this kind of stuff exposed, huh? I said loudly and insincerely to the two of them. What? What's this? This is voyeurism. It's a crime. Such a fool. Stop it. There's a child here too. Shut up, John. Be quiet. Hey, Anna. Are you okay being with a despicable man who cheats on his wife and has a child with another woman? I'll give you a piece of advice, young lady. Sure, it's partly because you're attractive, but women like that only compete on looks, nothing else. It's sad how empty they are inside, only young and pretty. I've seen a few like her. Because there are plenty of young women in the world. When they're only at ribute fades, they end up with nothing. Truly pitiful. Sorry, Anna. It's a hassle, huh? But don't worry. We'll quickly cut ties with these people and live here together. 
Yes. Um, sorry to interrupt your bonding, but you think you can live here? John, what does that mean? Which is it? What are you talking about? Don't you know? You had me sign a contract here five years ago. At that time, you had no savings. It was odd, but now I think about it, you were splurging on Anna. This place has a good location, it's new, the view is great, and since I signed the contract for this house, I'm not planning to give it up. What, John? If we can't live here, where will we go? My place is a cramped studio, and I already told the landlord I wouldn't renew. What are we going to do with a child? Oh, you two are going to be homeless then. That's terrible. I'm not that kind. That's going to be a problem. Oh, really? You told me the same thing. Maybe you're starting to understand how I felt back then? Hey, what will happen to our relationship? That, of course, will continue. Whether you continue or not doesn't matter. But, Anna, are you really okay with such a man? A big liar, soon to be jobless and homeless. What do you mean he'll be jobless? Hey, don't say any more. Why not? It doesn't involve me, so I might as well tell you. It's bound to come out anyway. Like I said earlier, my grandfather is the chairman of John's company, and it was my father who introduced him to his current job. And the reason John could work there is thanks to my grandfather and father. Since he tricked me and we're breaking up, I don't owe him anything anymore, and I think I'll get him fired. That's why he'll be jobless. And of course, I could get you fired from the same workplace if I wanted to, understand? You both are going to be fired. Don't drag Anna into this. Anna is at fault too. Normally, if you hear someone is in a relationship, you'd back off, right? How dreamy can you be? Ultimately, you're to blame. You've got to take responsibility. Please, being fired from the company right now is tough. There's a child, and I have no home, no savings. Please, just wait a bit longer. Three more months. It's just too sudden. At least until we can secure a place to live. No way. I can't ignore this when my granddaughter has suffered so much. Tell your own parents about your affair and the child and ask them for help. Now, hurry up and sign. The baby is crying. I can't bear to watch. John took the pen again towards the resignation letter and in that solemn atmosphere, continued writing. Anna, you write too. We don't need an employee who disrupts the company's morale with such vulgarity. John's hand trembled, and it took him a long time to finish writing. Anna, too, was sobbing as she wrote her resignation. I was tired of being angry and let out a deep sigh. After finishing the last characters on the resignation forms, John and Anna handed them to my grandfather. My grandfather took the resignation letters, and without saying a word, checked the contents. Amidst my grandfather's stern gaze, John bore the responsibility for his actions and accepted the consequences without running away. I watched as my grandfather received the resignation letters and stared intently at John. And don't forget the divorce papers. I know. And you know about the alimony, right? I've been so hurt by being cheated on and finding out about the secret child. It'll take me a while to recover. What? $30,000. You really are the worst person. Better than you. I demanded alimony from John, and he, while crying, obediently signed. After everything was written and they were carrying the secret child, the two walked out of the room confidently. They left through the front door, heads bowed. Seeing that, I laughed again. Grandpa, Thank you so much for coming all this way despite being busy. Of course. Times like these are exactly when you need your grandpa. But your dad really brought home a piece of work. I'll have to give him a little punishment too. That's true. I'll have to make sure dad gets his punishment. I'll let mom know. Next time.
I'll find the has-been candidate for Mary myself. That would be great. It feels like I could meet someone trustworthy that way. And so, the situation was resolved. John had once hoped for a new life with Anna. However, the alimony payments strained his finances, and his relationship with Anna worsened. It seems he tried to rely on his parents, but as expected, they did not help him, and he spent his days lost and wandering. His relationship with his love child also caused him great distress. He faced the difficulties of taking responsibility and building a relationship with his child, feeling the weight of his role as a father alongside his failing relationship with Anna. John was filled with regret for his actions. He deeply regretted that his affair with Anna destroyed his marriage and betrayed me, lamenting his own foolishness. Meanwhile, thanks to my grandfather, I began to walk a new path. The alimony became a stepping stone to start my new life, and I was successful in pursuing my own happiness. Despite being hurt by John's unfaithful actions in the past, it became a valuable experience that made me stronger and more developed as a person. Furthermore, I cherished the support from those around me and new encounters. With the support of friends and family, I built a new community to pursue my happiness. Over time, I recovered from past wounds, becoming stronger and more developed as a person. As a result, I found my happiness and success